on balanced governance um, for our, our new board. So we are happy to have um, Thomas Alsberry, who is the expert on um, effective boards across the country and, and even has a lot of experience in the world. So thank you, Thomas. Wow, how do you follow that intro? My goodness. Well, thank you very much, uh, President Phillips, and thank you for having me. We have a short time tonight. Um, uh, balanced governance training has uh, gone from between two hours and let's see, three days, eight hours per day was the longest the training lasted. <laughs> That was with 2,000 board members and superintendents in Mississippi a number of years ago. But yeah, it is true. If there, I wanted to show you what you've got tonight to, for the training, but we're going to go fairly quickly. We're not going to hit everything in the theory or in the model, but we're going to try to give you a, a little bit of an overview tonight. So you've got this. It's called the workshop materials. So that I will reference that every once in a while. Um, and you'll notice that in those materials, if you want to know a little bit more about me on page two, that gives you a little bit of a background. I think the most important thing is, uh, in my background, according to me, is that uh, I started as a teacher, as a high school chemistry and biology teacher. Um, I became a principal. I was the principal at Pullman High School. All my work was in the, in the state of Washington. I come from Prosser. And um, yeah, this is my hometown, so I love working with the Pasco District. But it is true, I sort of got drafted after um, being an administrator for 12 years and had the opportunity to lead uh, di some districts here in uh, Washington State. Those were in the, uh, in the years of the big Wassel testing, Do you get, if you guys remember that. And, and I was able to lead a district that was performing pretty poorly and we became the seventh highest performing school district in the state with all 12 grades scoring in the 90th percentile up from the 30th per and 40th percentile. And that school continues to still be successful today. That was a great opportunity for me to sort of see what it was like to uh, lead. Can you hear me, Amy? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I can hear you. What school was that? Uh, it was, it is the Nacelle Grays River Valley School District. They are now, they've been six time now, Washington State Blue Ribbon School, and one year mm -hmm. while I was there was the National School of the Year. And um, yeah, that was a transformation that I was fortunate to have come. I was actually, it was a weird story. We're not supposed to be talking about this time, but it was a weird <laughs> story. I think it's good background. You guys need to get to know me. I've been working with the PASCO board for a long time, and, and I'm hoping to continue that relationship. So it's good for us to know each other. Um, yeah, the, they uh, were bankrupt. They had all kinds of problems. Their building had been condemned, yada, yada. And the, they had a retired superintendent. The state uh, hired and said, go fix the district. So what he did, wonderful superintendent, came and found me uh, and said, I don't live there. I live in Wenatchee. I'll come by and visit once every couple of months. You're in charge. And this, uh, it's a one building K through 12 school with 350 kids. And I was the superintendent, the principal, and taught science classes at the high school. <laughs> So that was a great experience and um, took that later to, to Pullman and did some work there. I was kind of drafted out of there, a surprise to me. I never expected it to go to the university. I started at Iowa State University. I've always worked with the research on boards. My student uh, PhD di doctoral dissertation was on school board studies. I continued that line of research um, at Iowa State University. Eventually, I was a, became a full rank tenured professor at North Carolina State University. Um, developed the theory that I'm gonna share with you tonight. Wrote a bunch of publications and books. Traveled around the world. Advised uh, in nine different countries, ministries of eds on how to transform their school systems in those countries. Amongst those, uh, Finland and Taiwan and some of the high performing international countries. We, I eventually directed was the director for 12 years of a, uh, the UCEA, it's a, a um, 
organization that re represents all the research universities in the United States um, had a research center on the superintendency and board governance. And it used to be the superintendency and I added the board governance part and directed that, which gave me a great opportunity to be directly involved or indirectly involved with pretty much all of the research being conducted on superintendents and boards for about 20 year period. We did, a, there's a whole bunch of other parts to the story, fascinating things that I had a great opportunity to do, to be involved with. Um, we did eventually um, conduct the only national studies on school boards that to this day have ever been conducted and we conducted the only international studies on boards in eight countries and the U.S. simultaneously. So um, I share that and I'll stop there. But I share that with you only because I think it is important from the very beginning for you to know that balanced governance is unique. Let's see if I can make this work. Can I just click this clicker? Yeah, no? Yeah. Click the clicker, yeah. A balanced governance is unique amongst governance theories. Part of what I wanted to teach you guys tonight is a little bit of governance 101 um, on governance models that are out there. You may not realize that there are a few of them. Um, balanced governance is unique in that it emanated from research. It was not an ideology that was turned into a business <laughs> That, uh, that was led by that ideology. And most of the models, that is the case, okay? Um, these were retired superintendents or board members that later in uh, their retirement years started consulting companies and said, hey, we know how boards ought to be run. We ran a couple of boards successfully and so we're gonna create a model and started training. And so that's where most of them came from. I'm the oddball because I was and I still am just a professor um, that because of the research that I conducted, boards like the Pasco sc School Board um, said, hey, would you come and work with us? And I said, I'm not really a presenter, I'm a professor <laughs> that does research on boards. And they said, come anyway, and we wanna work with you. So I'm happy to work with you. I have had the opportunity um, in the last 23 years as a professor to work with a lot of districts. I've worked with um, five of the largest school districts in the United States, all the way down to the smallest school district I worked with was a district in North Pole, Alaska. It is the North Pole School District. And uh, that was fascinating. The last part of the journey to get to the board meeting was on a dog sled. Um, which I was taken to by one of the board members, the uh, Yupik elder, and uh, it was a fascinating training day. I will have to tell you though, that between some of the largest dis urban districts in the country and that little tiny district, you know what? The issues on the board, the things that make it successful or not so successful are really very similar because boards are made of people. And, uh, and it really comes down to that. So let's get into the training. You see the agenda here in front of you. Um, I've already, oh, I have to tell you before we leave this and get into this, that I was talking to your, your representative, Sydney and Emily. Um, you know, now that I am sort of pseudo retired, I'm still uh, teaching doctoral courses at Northwest University, but I'm not doing it full time. I'm supposed to be retired, so my wife got tired of me hanging around the house too much, and so she said, isn't there something you could do during the day? And so four years ago now, I said, well, what should I do? And she said, well, what made you the happiest? I said, well, 35 years ago, I, I really loved teaching high school chemistry and biology. She said, go do that. So I, I do that. Actually, my students, I'm now a full-time high school biology and chemistry teacher, and uh, my students have a substitute right now. <laughs> well, not anymore. <laughs> school is over. <laughs> but I enjoyed meeting you guys, so. And I'll tell my students all about you guys when I get back, okay? All right. Okay, so let's get into this. Um, we're gonna try to cover, uh, like I said, a few of the items that are on the agenda. 
I want to apologize, boy, how embarrassing, you know, you, you have new board members and what do I do? I put the wrong date on the agenda. <laughs> uh, it is not the 8th, it is actually the 9th of May. One of the things that happened with this board research, just I want to give you a little bit of background with research, is that a lot of the board models and a, and a lot of them even on their websites uh, for a long, long time, I think most of them have got wised up a little bit, but for a long, long time they said there is no research on boards, so we're just, you know, what we think is just as good as what the next person thinks. That's really not true. There is actually quite a bit of research done on boards. It's just, it's been difficult to um, sort of bridge that nexus between university researchers at R1 institutions and actual practitioners in the field. That's been a rare thing. And so oftentimes um, boards and superintendents don't really know as much about the research that's conducted. Um, so one of the things I provided for you, if you look on the worksheet materials, that one, you'll see starting on page three through five, I've included just a few, just a selection of some of the um, research that has been done on boards, including the peer-reviewed empirical research studies and then some other um, books and, and so forth. One of the things I remember vividly when I first became a professor, we had conducted a study here in the state of Washington, and we, I sent the study in for my first article to be published. I was really excited, I was brand new, and the uh, publisher sent, it was uh, EAQ, Educational Administration Quarterly, at that time the number one journal in ed educational administration in the country. Uh, they sent it back and said, we will not publish this because uh, it lacks face validity. I said, is there anything wrong with the methodology? No, everything looks good, everything's fine. We just basically don't believe it. Lacking face validity means um, you, know, you can show that there's a correlation between marshmallow production and marriages in Tennessee, but we all know that they aren't connected to each other. And they were basically saying that about my study. And that's because my study said what you see on the screen. It basically demonstrated that, in fact, there was some kind of a connection between how the board practiced what they did in the boardroom and performance in schools in the districts they governed. And this journal and a lot of other people said that's nonsense. Boards don't have anything to do with the success or failure of the districts they govern. No, no effect. And everybody knows that. And in fact, what you may not realize is that for the, for the previous 50 years, there had been about 30 peer-reviewed studies that in fact supported that idea that boards have no effect on students. My study showed that in fact they did have an effect and that's where balanced governance came from. That was the beginning of it. So I'm here to tell you that since then, I'm happy to say that many other articles have been published on board governance. A lot of them have been my students, uh, and uh, I'm very proud to say who are now professors, and they carry on the work. But we have now, I think, solidly turned the nation to understand that boards do, in fact, make a difference. And, uh, and that's what, what we're all about, okay? So to make the difference though, we have to govern in the way that will support improvement of student learning. So governance models, let's get into that. What are they and how do they differ? So let me, this is the first quiz, so I want you to, I wanna ask you a question. Do you know, no fair looking, don't look ahead, but uh, have you heard of any governance models? You've probably heard of a few. Anyone? Do you want me to answer? Me well, to Amy, answer? Amy, you know, I think, but that, let's see, do, does, do our new board members, do they know? Have you heard of any models? Well, I've heard of balance governance. You've heard of that, yeah, yeah of course, of course, of course, yeah. So Rosa, are you, uh, did you have a thought there? It looked like you were gonna. 
Okay. Okay. Welcome, welcome, Vincent. Sorry. And that's okay. No, nice to meet you. Are we, is it okay, um, Superintendent Whitney, for me to use first names? Should I should I should ask the board? Is that okay tonight? Or are yes, we being please. formal? Okay. All right. You can call me Tom, by the way. Okay. Well, just in case, because a lot of times board members have heard of a few at least, okay? There is a variety of board models. These are the main ones that have been used um, nationally since the 1960s. Um, the one that is the most predominant is the, about the third one down, which is called policy governance or Carver's policy governance. That was also a model picked up and uh, promoted by a guy named Eli Broad in Texas. Um, this was a model that really came from the business community and it was, the idea was that the board would hire a CEO. In fact, Carver was responsible for changing the title of superintendents nationally to CEO. Most state associations, school board associations, adopted the Carver model and most of them still use that model predominantly today. Um, with some slight variation, which we've seen more recently. Um, the idea was that the school should be run sort of more like a, like a business in this respect. That is that the superintendent is like the CEO. They run the organization entirely. The board will act like a board of directors and you simply have one role. Your role is to set quotas you know, if you were making widgets, you'd, you'd say we want to make this many widgets or we want to make this much money on our, our stock value. In school uh, parlance, it would be we want our test scores to go up a certain percentage. And then you just kind of wait around to the end of the year. Don't really care about how we get from point A to point B. Don't really want to know. But at the end, you're going to see did we get there. And if we got there, we throw a party. If we did not get there, you fire the superintendent and go get yourself another one. We see that a lot in sports these days, right? Too many, too many losing seasons, just fire the manager, go get a new one. That's kind of how it was done. In fact, Carver was, uh, and the, the folks that tr teach Carver's model were famous for on their website for years and years, decades really, saying this. This is a quote from their site. They've now taken it down um, after we had a little conversation and they looked at at my research. They it used to say this, the means are the enemy of the board. So again, back to what I described. You, you were to set the ends, the end goal outcomes, but you had no business really knowing how we get there, what we're doing to get there, et cetera. Uh, integrated governance. Integrated governance kind of made a huge splash um, my book in 2008, which was a book that brought together all the then surviving writers of school board theory, and uh, included in them were Wong and Shen out of Brown and Harvard Universities, and they wrote what's called the Integrated Governance Theory. That particular theory said that there should not exist locally elected school boards. This began a wave across the United States where in the end about 200 large urban districts no longer had elected school boards. They had, govern or they had uh, the uh, mayors of the, the city and a city council representatives running the, the schools. New York City still has that arrangement. There's three education panel members that are part of the city council and the mayor runs the, the schools. At that time, Wang and Chen said, this will work, this will be so much better than these elected boards because we're gonna get people in there that really know what they're doing, that are professional educators, and they'll do so much better job than folks that are elected. You know, what do those people know, right? They're just people from the community. Well, none of that turned out, I'm thankful to say, to be the case. In fact, now we've conducted recent studies. Um, in fact, proponents of this theory have now admitted that actually the best boards, the most effective boards, are not only those that are locally elected, 
but those board member amongst those board members they want a variety of folks they don't want everybody on the board to be a professional educator or a past teacher or administrator. They don't want everybody on the board to be a business person. In fact, our studies have correlated boards with majority or mostly business folks or mostly past educators are not correlated to student learning improvement. They're actually connected to student learning decline. The boards that are the most successful have a mixture folks that come from all different walks, all different occupations, they understand the breadth of the community that they serve. And that's why they're so successful, right? Because you're there for everyone in the community, right? I won't go through all of the rest of these. Um, coherent governance is, is uh, kind of making a resurgence of Quinn and Dawson. And then community in action is a brand new theory there at the very bottom, which is a theory that has to do with activism. This is a really new. In other words, um, these board members are encouraged to not work together as a team. They are encouraged to be, create as much disruption as possible. Um, and through that chaos and disruption, they will achieve their goal of tearing down whatever the existing system is and bringing in whatever the new system is. So there you have it. Now what we found in our research and all of these theories, like I mentioned, emerged from an ideological predisposition that, that led to their creation. What we did instead, as I mentioned, is was we reviewed the research from high-performing school boards and low-performing school boards in a, a quite large national study of school boards correlated against all of the metrics that make schools successful. That includes superintendent, administrative, tenure, teacher turnover, student performance, uh, student on tests, um, the support of the community on bonds and levies, and a variety of other metrics. This was a we looked at districts over 50 year long longitudinal data. We looked at election results and there, we could go on and on and on about how you can tell when the community starts to become dissatisfied, et cetera. We don't have time for that tonight. But what we found was that there was in fact a connection between how boards um, did their business, what their standards were, and also their practices in the boardroom itself did have an impact on whether their school had success moving forward. And simply wrote those down. And I'm gonna present some of those things to you tonight. So one of the things that popped out in this research as we kind of reversed engineered it is a continuum. We found that boards that engage in what's called overreach, um, it has also been called micromanagement. This is uh, something you probably have already been taught if you have any courses from WASDA. This has been the popular mantra for a long, long time. There's nothing new here. You'll, you'll be told over and over, don't micromanage, don't micromanage, don't micromanage. And in fact, we did find, in fact, that that didn't lead to great success when it came to um, student uh, school, uh, school performance. However, the thing that was new that we discovered that nobody else had was that we found that disengaged boards were equally poor at their job. That is the board that says, well, we're gonna hire a really good superintendent and then we're just gonna stay out of it. These have been called rubber stamp boards as well. Okay. And that kind of goes back to the original models that I talked about like policy governance where it's we're just gonna hire a good leader, then we're just gonna stay out of the way, they'll do whatever they do, and then we'll, look at, we'll see at the end if they're successful or not. And then we'll either keep them or we'll fire them. We didn't find that that was very effective, and it certainly didn't have any sustainability. What we saw was that occasionally, and this has been replicated um, several different times by doctoral student studies in a variety of states, you will get flash in the pans of success. So you'll hire a great superintendent like Michelle, and you could probably stand back and she'd pretty much do a good job. All right, for you. But the problem was it's not sustainable. 
Um, not all superintendents do a fab fantastic job. In addition to that, understand that most superintendents tenure nationally is hovering around four years, and in urban centers, it's less than two years, the tenure of superintendents. So even if you get lucky and get a great superintendent, they're not gonna be there for very long, typically. So just like a great principal, we've seen this in school for decades, where you'll have a, a school super successful, great principal, the principal will move or you know, go elsewhere and all of a sudden the school, it's, it's a good school still, but it's not the great school that you had before. And so we've seen that and the same thing happens with super, superintendents. What we found was that boards over and over again that engaged in neither extreme but were in a, what I, what kind of became the name of the model, balanced, they were balanced in their role became the most successful. So um, I already talked about this research, so I'm gonna go really quickly through this. Um, you have this in your packet, I've already pointed it out. So uh, we found that board tenure or board turnover has a direct effect on superintendent turnover and then student performance. So boards that were destabilizing, that is chaos, they were in conflict with each other, they were polarized as a team, uh, didn't get a whole lot done, led to polarization in the community, the community becomes dissatisfied as they watch the three ring circus going on, and where you think, well, nobody cares, nobody's coming to the board meetings after all. This was the mistake. All that research that was done previously, that's, what, that's why they said there's no connection between the board and what happens in the schools, because look, look at the room. But here's what we found, that's because they took a snapshot at one point in time, yeah, it looks like this, but something goes wrong, the community becomes dissatisfied, all of a sudden the room is filled, people start running for board seats, people start coming out for board elections, and the community changes the board. Um, so the community is either satisfied enough but when they cross that line and become dissatisfied, that's when they take action. And across the country, we see boards being changed all the time over that. The theory, ready for it, is called the dissatisfaction theory of American democracy. And it was developed in, in the late 1960s and the authors of that are in my 2008 book to talk about it. But we see this still happens. The Lighthouse Studies was the next big major set of studies. And you'll see my studies and the Lighthouse Studies are predominant amongst most school board associations in their references to research on, on boards, board governance. Um, Mary Delagardell, who is the author of the Lighthouse Studies, uh, was my student. And I was the research consultant on the Lighthouse Studies project. And I was the professor at Iowa State University, and that's where Mary was. And um, she is unfortunately no longer with us, but a wonderful lady and did amazing things for governance. She engaged uh, through, we, we had a US Department of Ed grant, a long time grant, and that's where we looked at these interconnected, intervening variables that supported the correlations. We could say that what boards members do matters to student performance, but people would say, eh, you can't prove that. There's too much distance between the boardroom and the classroom. And so we said, okay. So we, again, did a mixed methodology study which included interview, observation of every level of the organization for multiple years in multiple states including sitting in classrooms, interviewing students, teachers, administrators, superintendents, directors, school board members, to see is there a connection between what the board does and student performance. And here's what we found. Glass kind of um, gives us a good synopsis of what we see happening. If we see uh, a decline in school board tenure and the and a revolving door in the superintendency, the organization loses 
a memory um, and experience uh, on the board. It lacks consistent strategic goals. Out in the buildings, we, we see a decline in staff morale. They, feel, they do not feel secure anymore. How would you feel if you had your, a new boss every couple of years with a new set of ideas on how things should be done? You wouldn't like it. It's destabilizing. So great directors, when they see revolving door boards and revolving door superintendents say, I'm gonna go look someplace else that's more stable. And when that happens, when great directors leave, great building uh, principals leave, if they can. When great principals leave, great teachers leave, if they can. And when great teachers leave, student performance begins to decline. And we saw this, we tracked it and saw it like a domino effect. So there's never going to be a quantitative study that can absolutely prove that connection between the board's uh, practices and student performance, but we have qualitative research and the correlations that have demonstrated over and over again. All right. And then I have mentioned the studies that we did. Two of them are listed here. I'll go by that. There have been some follow-up studies. Uh, our studies are starting to get a little bit older. You can see that they've been a, they're a few years old. Um, but there are follow-up studies that are being conducted. This one on policy governance. Policy governance, um, what the study found was, um, and I described it too, it was kind of the CEO model. Usually policy governance is really effective for a board that has no direction. So if they don't have any governance policies and they don't, they don't have any procedures or protocols, policy governance comes in with those policies, procedures, and pro protocol protocols. And that is always a good thing. It's, it's always better to have some guidance than to fly by the seat of your pants. The problem is, is that because the authority is then transferred almost exclusively to the superintendent and the board no longer plays a role, you can read it for yourself. I have some quotes on the screen. The board members began to find that this delegation of authority and this strict adherence to the superintendent um, uh, being in charge and them not having a role led to them questioning their, um, the importance of their existence. Why are we here? What's our role? And they then found it to be very unsatisfying, unsatisfying, as did the communities that they served in. And it was not, in the end, very effective. So what I always say to folks, because a lot of associations, as I told you, still use policy governance. That is their training model. That's what they use. And they say, why should we change it? It's, it was been successful for 50, 60 years. I think culture has changed in the United States. I think culture has changed in communities. I don't think that people are okay with just saying, that's the CEO, just trust them, do whatever they say, don't question authority. I don't think we're there anymore. So whereas that you, maybe that used to work, I don't think it works anymore. Um, and communities aren't satisfied by it. On the other end. Just a second, yeah. Mr. Alford, um, is, or Tom, um, yeah. is, when did you get rid of policy government? Coherent. 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 Yeah. Okay. It was a line for all of us. Okay. It was a little more policy governance. Yeah. Coherent. Just to give you the background, um, mm -hmm. coherent governance is the uh, Quinn and Dawson, who called me after I I keynote did the keynote speeches for 29 of the uh, state associations over a couple of years after the 2015 book came out. Um, and I, went, I was the keynoter at Colorado and that's how I met them because they called when I got home and said, hey, what are you, what are you trying to do, steal our business, buddy? So <laughs> I said, hey, I'm, I'm not a business person. I'm. But their story is that they were trained by John Carver. They were policy governance trainers, both of them. Uh, they branched out and said, we're gonna create our own consulting company in Aspen, Colorado, 
is where they're located, and it's what I call policy governance light. They realized culture had changed a little bit, people weren't gonna go along with just do what the CEO says, and so they just sort of modify it a little bit. They took the, the means or the enemy of the board, they took that off their website, and they say, yeah, you should probably know some of the stuff that's going on in the district where you're a board member, but you still shouldn't really have any role in that. <laughs> so that's, that's how I describe it. Well, and that's what I remember. The first that, few it, years on the board, it was much more policy driven yeah. and we were told to stay hands off. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I appreciate this because I feel like it's more effective and, and, I, and I think it helps all of us to be more involved and more effective ourselves because when you back away and you stop caring, you stop being effective. And when you don't feel like you're valued or you're Thank you. Um, this is just some confirmatory research that you see on the screen um, of what we're talking about, that the relationship or, or teamwork amongst the board is a critical element that is linked to boards being successful. The bottom line is that board work is a team sport. It is not a solo venture. So you live or die. You can, it's like, if you want to use sports analogies, you can go hot dog it, but that doesn't get the team very many wins in the end. It, boards that are the most effective work together as teams. They understand the importance of that. And we'll talk about that balance because you have sometimes issues that you disagree with. The community has issues they disagree with each other on that are even polar polarizing with each other and you have to navigate that in a very in, uh, significant or uh, a very careful, I'll say, way. And I'll talk a little bit about that tonight. So board governance, balanced governance is what we found. This is the book. Um, I'd recommend that you take a look at it. Um, we are not the, this, this was not the only, you know, when we discovered this data in the research, I went out in search of other organizations that had governance training models that were balanced. I, I thought they were whistling the same tune and we found a few um, here and there uh, and they are in the book. So the chapters come from those individuals from a variety of, of organizations in business and elsewhere that are using a more balanced approach to governance. This has become, balanced governance has now become pretty popular, there are a number of states statewide that use it. Um, and now I was uh, sharing with Michelle that, and, and Amy and Amanda that, that I'm gonna be traveling to um, Tunisia and I'm gonna be doing training for all the boards and uh, heads of schools they're called in the Mediterranean region, the, all the US embassy schools in that region of the world. So that'll be, That'll be an interesting thing. So Phil Gore interviewed me as a new board member for that book. And I believe I, there is a quote, quote for me in that book, but it wasn't attributed to me. It was attributed to a new board member, but I thought that was really oh, that's interesting. You, huh? that's but you. I think it was because of you, because I came to that thing my first year as a board, and by my name, and he gave me a call. So anyway. Yeah, um, Phil is still good. He just moved to Idaho, <laughs> so he's up there now. He wasn't in Texas. So Phil used to work for WASDA. He was basically the guy who did all the training, all the governance training for all the boards in the state of Washington. And, um, and we worked together for a long, long time and used to do a, a lot of the training at WASDA as well. That's how I think we ran into each other um, before. All right. So I've already talked a bit about this. This is just another way to think about the difference between balanced governance and and a, like policy governance. Policy governance and balanced governance both put a, um, a heavy responsibility on the school board members to oversee what's going on in the district. That's important and critical. The difference is though that I balanced governance, we found that the board needs to be informed about how things are being done as well, that there has to be that combination. There can't just be oversight of outcomes, so that mixture. We see in the data the following kind, all focused to balance. We've already talked about effective boards balance between micromanaging and rubber stamping. 
We already saw that. Uh, effective boards, this is a big one. Effective boards m monitor strategic goals. They don't only focus on ends and outcomes. They don't focus too much on process and operations, but they have a healthy mixture of the two. And they do that through the monitoring of strategic goals. And they're very, very serious about that. Their <coughs> board meetings, that is the majority of the time they spend. One of the things I do is evaluate, I watch board meetings. And in fact, I just finished writing a report this morning from a very large district, one of the, I think their number six biggest district in the country, um, of their board meetings for last year. Monitoring goals and, and setting goals is critical. And then the last one is the focus of those goals and of the board is on student learning, not on buses, books, and buns. That's, there's an article actually that's written about that. Okay. Boards don't get into the weeds in talking about operations and management. They focus in on what impacts students most directly with their student learning. That's what they're talking about. That's what they're discussing. Those are the reports that they're seeing in the board meetings. Okay. And unfortunately, I hate to tell you that most boards don't do that. They don't do that at all. In fact, most boards, because they don't really have a role, because they've adopted a model that like some that I've talked about, you fill a vacuum, you fill a void. And if you don't have any of that information, what are you gonna talk about? And so like a board in uh, Jefferson County, Louisville, Kentucky, large board that I was working with a few years ago, I watched a board meeting. Board meeting lasted three hours. For two and a half of those three hours, the board debated, argued, discussed, which side of the school bus you should put the gas tank. Now that's called getting into operations and management in an intense way. So we don't, you don't wanna be there as a board. Um, sometimes it's helpful to see um, just everyday people's words about these governance models and what are the differences. And so I call this the supermarket encounter. This would be if you walked into the supermarket, what would you hear somebody say? If you came up, if somebody came up to you and said, what's going on down there at that school anyway? Here's what you might hear from a board member that is a disengaged board member that has passed everything off to the superintendent. These are actual quotes from our study I call this benign cheerleading or benign or uninformed critic. It, they, they don't really know what's going on. They either love the school, they don't really know why, or they hate the school for various reasons, but they don't really know what's going on. They just cheer or disparage one way or the other. The community we found these days is not very satisfied in this. Board members that engage in this kind of an approach have a very short tenure. And they don't get much accomplished. In fact, these are some of the results that we found in board members who engage in this model, where they tend to be a rubber stamp board or disengage from what's going on. These are all the kinds of metrics that we measure, that occurs, and in the end, we see learning, student learning is inconsistent. This is back to if you get lucky, you might get a great superintendent, and, but then it's not sustainable. Where it says system majors on the minors, does that mean that you're getting into the weeds a lot? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, when you watch board, boards that, are, that are, take this model, that's what we see. You never see them talking about what's really important is student learning. We're talking about all this other stuff. So you go to the other side, if, if you're an overreaching micromanaging board member, if you're taking on that approach, that's the community in action theory, amongst a few other models of working on the board. Um, these are the kinds of things that those board members say.
we see the same kind of results from board members that engage in this extreme of the continuum, the other extreme of the continuum, and these are the kinds of things that we see happening in those boards that take that approach. These are, these are also what we see in boards, and there's more, there have been more of them. This is a recent, there's been a recent surge in this post-COVID, because a lot of the community members were unhappy, right? Because of the masking things and all, all of that, and a variety of other issues that have popped up recently, and boards that then have begun to overreach and micromanage and play the activist game, the power manipulation or power play kind of politics on the local boards, which we haven't, hadn't seen before historically, but we're now seeing it more and more and more. And they're blowing up boards. This is what we see happening in those districts. And some of these are a little bit unexpected like problems are hidden from the administration. There's an unexpected one. Did you know that if the transportation, if you get a call from somebody and says, that transportation program you've got down there at Pasco stinks, and uh, you should do something about it, board member, and then you get, you get in your car and you drive down the transportation because you're a micromanaging board member, right? And you tell the transportation person what's what. Do you know that you've just harmed the ability for that organization to improve? Because I'll tell you what's gonna happen. The transportation person is gonna hear you and they're gonna go, okay, they're gonna fix that problem. They're gonna plug the dike with their finger in that hole and then you're happy and that parent's happy but the real problem hasn't been fixed. It's the squeaky wheel got fixed. But there's a dozen other people that are unhappy that are, will never call you, that you'll never hear from but at some point, just like that dissatisfaction theory of American democracy predicts, there'll be a tipping point and that community will become dissatisfied enough where then you won't be on the board anymore. And you'll wanna know what is going on, what happened? We thought we were doing okay. And then we weren't doing okay, but that's partly what causes it. Better to put that information to the superintendent into the system that can then go and record it and then eventually take action on either remediating that individual to do a better job, hopefully, that's the resolution, or to let them go if we can't get the improvement that we need. Okay, see how that works? The other really interesting thing is the Jekyll Hyde effect for board members that kind of take the activist role. Um, Seattle School District, good friend of mine who served on the board came before he ran for the, the board, Stephen Blanford. He's no longer on it. He was the, at that time, the only African American on the Seattle School Board. He came and said, Tom, what do I do? Um, my community wants me to be an activist. They want me to be the voice of the African American student. I think I should be the voice for all the students, not just a particular group of students, but what do I do? And what we, what we learn from this is that you can win elections by playing that card of I'm going to be the voice for X, fill in the blank, whatever it is. The problem is that once that board member is elected, if they continue to engage in that approach where they're a one interest or, or one topic board member, they're only talking about that one topic, that one group of students, that one issue, and they keep hammer, 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 it polarizes the board. They don't make much, much progress on their special interests. And what's really shocking is that the community that voted them in are the same people that then vote them out. They usually don't last one, more than one term. It's because the community says, we want you to make all these changes so we're gonna elect you, but then when they watch a board in dysfunction that's polarized, that's not making movement forward, then they become dissatisfied and then you're gone because you didn't get the job done. And this is unfair and confusing to new board members because they come in, you know, loaded for bear. They were told if you, you know, you do this, we're going to support you. But the community has this kind of Jekyll Hyde effect. They don't understand that to move forward, you have to work as a team. You can't come in and polarize the board. You never make progress that way. 
What we find is that also student uh, superintendents don't like to work with boards like that. It's very chaotic and so you, great superintendents then leave. And guess what? The superintendent network is very, very small. Nationally, it's very small. So you don't, you don't get candidates even applying for that district anymore. Okay. And then performance begins to decline because you're good people. They don't want to work in chaos. So once again, what we find is that the balanced boards, the boards that work in this, with these balance of roles, not with either extreme, seem to be the most effective. So the kind of thing with a balanced board member would say, if they're in the supermarket, someone said, what's going on at that school? Go ahead and take a second to read that. So hopefully you can see in that the balance. Do you see that? This board member, they're, they're not, they, they're knowledgeable about what's going on. They're not just a benign critic. Everything's terrible. They're not a cheerleader. Everything's wonderful. They admit there's, there's some things we need to improve. They know what the district is, how areas of the district is doing well, areas the district is not doing so well. They know what the district is attempting to try and be better. Um, and they're on it. They're monitoring it. Okay, that's what we see with effective boards. And, and this is really good because I, you might have already experienced this, that you do get stopped in the supermarket, and you get stopped at, at sporting events, and you get st stopped when you go to um, like that volunteer appreciation, and to the, um, what are you just, anyway, to, to all of these different things that we're invited to, and we go to, and things that to for our own children and we will get stopped and it is really nice to have some of these things you know in your head hey this is what's happening this is what we're doing because and the community really appreciates it when instead of you just saying oh yeah I totally agree you say oh well or oh that's not happening that's not what's going on you know either one of those don't work they, that's not what they really don't want to hear that because they just don't answer. What they want to hear is, oh yeah, we recognize that this is an issue. This is what we're doing. And so being really knowledgeable about what is going on in the school helps you speak intelligently to those to those people and it helps them gain trust in, in the whole board because they realize the whole board is being educated that they know and they're aware of problems and they're dealing with it. And if it's not being, hey, I don't, I'm not really sure on that, let me check into that and get back to you. I mean, those kind of answers are really important. That saying, oh, I know, I know this is terrible, or you're so wrong, that's not what's going on. Neither one of those answers works. Yeah. So I love this. It's also not very satisfying to say to them, well, the mass score, we, we set it to go up 5% this year, and they don't have to be Yeah, that doesn't that, That's not very satisfying to a parent either. Oh, so my kid has to suffer through a terrible situation until the end of the the superintendent's contract. <laughs> That's what you're telling me? <laughs> See, it doesn't work. What you describe really, really nicely, Amy. That, that's what the community give, gives the community confidence. That there's leadership there. That they know what's going on. That they're on it. They're working on it. Not perfect, but they're working on it. They're monitoring it. And guess what? Then it goes back to some of the other things I've shared. If in your board meetings you're never seeing the stuff that this person said, you, you, d you don't know about the program. You've never seen the data on how things are going. You can't say this if all you do is debate finances and facilities at board meetings. So there again, that's why we see that connection with boards that are discussing and monitoring and receiving reports on student learning directly. They spend 70% of their board meeting time on those things. Those are the boards that are having great effect on their districts. And it's no surprise. We see all of these things then begin to happen. 
We see stability in the system, support from the community, stability in the administrative roles, the teachers, and then, unsurprisingly, we then see a positive impact on student learning. So, just because of our short time, um, I wanted to focus, we, we can't focus on everything, but we're gonna focus on one component that of effective boards. And that is, that, are, that is the uh, practices that individual board members engage in as, in, in their board role, okay? So the first one that we see is, and there's 10 of them, role boundaries. We've been talking about this all night, so I'm gonna go right by it. I will point out to you though, this idea of informed oversight. So boards that are effective engage in informed oversight of student, direct student learning initiatives. They don't, they're not rubber stampers, they're not disengaged, but they're also not overreaching or micromanaging. They're playing an important role of being knowledgeable and monitoring throughout the year. So I thought that I would throw in because I didn't, want to just talk at you for the whole time. Uh, so I had a th few questions I wanted to throw in and see what you guys think. So we're just gonna take a minute. I want you to turn to a neighbor and see what you can come up with with these two questions. What do you think? So balance or I'm going to go ahead and stop you. Um, I'm sure that wasn't enough time. By the way, I don't. I hate being behind the podium. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you that I don't do that when I'm teaching. I'm, I was tempted. I almost left just a second ago, but I don't think I can leave because it's the meeting's being recorded, and uh, so by state law, I have to remain here behind the microphone. Is that's right, right? So I'm kind of trapped, huh? Into a microphone. That's so. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm not complaining, but I just wanted to let you know I would actually rather be out there so you, with, so you with you guys. Use ours if you want. Yeah, I'd have to run over and talk into your mic. So well, we, you actually can use my handheld. Could I? Use it. Yeah. Could I do that? Oh, sure. that's awesome. Because I, I, I can't. I don't like being behind the podium. Oh, so no way for me to get this. Okay. So I just have to talk into this, right? Correct. And that's so that no. everyone at home can. Hear. No problem. No problem. Okay. So let's start with our students because they always know best. So who wants to ta tackle this one? What do you guys think? Hi, Logan, by the way. You want to take this? Yeah, I got okay. it. Um, I mean, I've never really gotten any complaints in my email, so I'd probably just forward it to one of the other board members, honestly, because I don't really see why they would email us about any <laughs> query. Like, unless it was like something I said, then I would probably back it up, but I would probably just forward it to one of the other board members. Okay, good. A student, though? 
Oh, if it was a student, it depends on what the issue was. If it was something talked about at a board meeting, I'd probably feel more comfortable sending it to a board member. Okay, okay. I feel like one of the other things we do most best would also research what, what they're talking about. So if they bring it up, try and find out what you can about it and then go ahead and bring it up to board members or superintendent, principal, whoever is next up on that list. Yeah, excellent, yeah, very good. Did you, did you want to share, Emily, or? You're good. Okay. Do, do you guys get com do you guys get questions when you're at the schools about board and board practices or what you do at all? You do. Yeah. But they don't like uh, complain about it. They just ask like, oh, what do you do on the board meetings or what do you share or what the board members share or how's the experience and everything. So then I tell them, and yeah. But <laughs> there's no like. Okay. We love getting letters from the students, even though some of them are like, hey, how come this isn't happening or whatever. It's it's really good to hear that. So that's something yeah. you can tell your friends. Well, write the board, ask him or anyway. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Who else would share? Let's get a board member. Okay, John. Um, so Amy and I discussed uh, the first question, but I think actually both pertain to each other. So if I was to receive an email or a phone call from a, a, consi uh, a constituent or you know any, anyone really with a question or, or a, a challenge that they're facing, um, well, first you know every single person has um, a legitimate standpoint, and it's it's for me to be empathetic and to try to understand them from their perspective, and then if I if I, if I feel comfortable responding in terms of a helpful way, then I might and CC the superintendent. But odds are I'll probably, I probably won't have the expertise to address that, to that question or concern. So I'll forward it to the superintendent and ask the superintendent to follow up with the individual as appropriate as that superintendent uh, believes is appropriate. And then follow up with the superintendent to make sure that that engagement happened. And um, this was discussed in boot camp at WASDA, but um, you know, I, I've also worked um, at an organization with a board as staff, and so I understand the importance of that separation between board members and staff, and so I have one staff member, and that's Superintendent Whitney, and I don't have anyone else. And so, that, so my, my engagement is always to the superintendent and to no one else. Yeah. And I really believe that it has to be that buffer there. Yeah. Great. Anyone want to add anything to that? Great answer. Logan, you were right on. Uh, you, uh, Sydney and Emily, you, you guys agree with John. That's the answer. And I won't expand on it because you hit it. You hit it on the head. That's exactly what you would do. So effective boards, they direct concerns to the superintendent. Look there, I got it, I got it right. Boy, I'm relieved. <laughs> I'm relieved. Let's see, how did I do? Um, they don't serve as a spokesperson for the staff. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this has been a trend nationally, too, that's really been a problem for boards. Board members somehow think uh, they're now the union president, the teacher's union president. You're not. They, they have a union. They have plenty of representatives. They have plenty of voice. They, ha they sit at the table to negotiate. That's their avenue. To, to have their say. <clears throat> you don't have to be the representative, okay? Right, you, you represent everyone. You represent the kids, you represent the teachers, you represent the parents, and so that's the role that you need to serve. You can't just be the representative exclusively for one group, particularly, particularly the staff. There was research done, this was, uh, we included this in the most recent book, a 2015 book um, by brilliant researchers here called Bridging and Bonding. This is a concept of the bridging and bonding concept has been called different things at different times, but um, it's basically the question of with effective boards, the most effective boards, you've got oh, this way. You've got bonding is 
the bonding you do as a board, the teamwork aspect, okay? Bridging is out here. That's bringing voices in from the outside. The million dollar question is, for board members often is, which role am I supposed to play? Am I the voice of the community? Am I bringing the voice of the community in? Is that my role? Or is my role to work to create a team within the board? And to the extent that there's polarizing topics that come into play, how strongly do I bring the voice in from the outside versus how, how much do I not? What is the correct balance that we see in the most effective board members? That's the million dollar question. So, with that in mind, what I'd like you to do, and we're gonna take about 15, 10, 15 minutes to do this, I'd like you to see if you guys can come up with the, the answer to that question. Should a board play a delegate role or a trustee role? And we're gonna use, if you'll turn to page, not, uh, page six, rather, in your packet, those of you who have had me uh, my training before, this will look familiar to you. But page six is an actual school district situation, a scenario that occurred. At the time this occurred, it made national news. It was in North Carolina, and I was there when it occurred, okay? So I was interviewing the board members and the superintendent, et cetera, to get this information. So what I'd like you to do is, with a partner that's sitting next to you, I'd like you to just scan through this situation that occurred to a board on page six here. And then I'd like you, in thinking about the role that the board should play and how they should play it, I'd like you to answer the question of what should the board, what did the board do right and what should the board have done differently to avoid the problems that they encountered? It's great now. Yeah, I'm good. So <laughs> that's good. What do they do right? What did they do wrong? And I'll answer any questions you have. If you want more information about this district, I'm happy to sh give you that information. You don't even have to worry about that. Just go ahead and analyze what happened and see if you can come up with what do you think went right and what went wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll circle back. I'll show you how this might apply, but yeah. Yes. 
2007 to 2009. I want to like yeah. name this reform, you know. So I'm trying to think of like 2007 to 2009. Yeah, those were the Obama years, right? And so I wasn't teaching that. <laughs> So, I think that we're the, about the same age. I just am a, I'm a late starter, I'm a late bloomer. So, so whatever for farm support, yeah, like and, <laughs> and only in elementary, that creates a lot of That's, well, either. So maybe the reforms were about that. And then, and then it sounds like multiple early release days added for staff development. So we're throwing in a lot of like wrenches into the into family. Yeah. So needy families are, and families where both parents are working under the daycare. And then year round schools might help that, but only in elementary school. So then you have families with more than one, one kid and multiple levels having different schedules. You guys have it set. You're done, so right? You got the answers. You have no all idea. the solutions. Yeah, you do. I heard you talking about it. We might have one of those. Okay. We're, we're looking for the There's obviously the some okay. discontent in the community because. Yeah. All right. Okay, the students have it have figured it all out. So go ahead. <laughs> Who's going to be the spokesperson? Sydney, are you doing this? Yeah, why not? Okay, Let's go, ahead. go for it. Give us yours. Um, you asked us where they went wrong and where they went right. Yes. Well, I think all of us students agreed that where they went wrong was where the board adopted reforms trending that year, because it it's trending one that year, and it's trending probably outside of the community, and what happens outside of the community is not gonna be the same inside of the community, so you can't take something from outside and implement it where it might not work. Ooh, ooh. Now, the fascinating thing about this, there's two things that are fascinating about this. This was, I told you, this was a story that happened when I was there in Raleigh, North Carolina. When I present this to big groups, people come up to me afterwards and say, you got this from our district, didn't you? This, is ha this happens over and over and over again. Your answers, I also want to point out, as you, as you listen to the answers, brilliant answer, by the way, you guys, you're going to see the 10, remember we're studying 10 things that make board, uh, that's effective board practice. That's one of them. You just named one. It's called fo effective board members use contextualized solutions for local issues. They do not transplant national issues into their community and they do not go grab the flavor of the month standardized program and try to force fit it into their community because everybody else is doing it. That you, that's it, one of them. That's one of the 10 right there. See, you're brilliant, that's great. Okay, let's keep this going, what, what else? I want to kind of piggyback on um, Sydney's comment because, you know, even taking like an example that we just did, we just, we put in AVID in over the whole entire school district. Yes, great. The Good program. The board had been saying, we want to see more of this. We want better organization. We want better communication. We want our kids to be college ready. We want them to have the skills. We want them to be able to, and, and at the same time, we had AVID in some of our schools. And so the superintendent brought back and said, listen, we have teachers advocating for this. We have, we've seen the success of this. It answers your questions. So rather than this new flavor of the month from externally, we've already seen it working in our district. And it answers the problems that the board is saying, we need to do this, you know, we need to fix these problems, not we need to bring in this to fix it. That's not our responsibility. And then we adopted AVID as our thing to, to um, um, uh, anyway, the superintendent evaluation was based on, and our district goals were based on AVID. So, so it went very much like that organically. I think the next thing on here was reform was driven by the superintendent. The superintendent wow. shouldn't drive reform. The superintendent should be collaborative 
And I think Superintendent Whitney has really helped me with this. She has shown me how things, the move, needle has moved infinitely more when you have collaborative, um, collaborative groups deciding on how we solve problems. We can, when, once we agree on a problem, a superintendent isn't gonna be the best person to decide how that works. She's not, neither is the board. Um, you need a group of people who have lots of different ideas to come together and come up with the best idea. And the best idea is collaborative. And let me ask you, Amy, that's fantastic. You're right. Why did the board do that? Why did they go along with these reforms? Because the community wasn't, see, we've been here. We have been here. Our district has been here. And the community is upset. And so the board wants to show, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change this. I'm going to make it better. I'm going to do this. Because then it shows that I'm doing what I did to get elected rather than when you get elected saying, okay, we're going to take, take a step back. We don't know how to change this. And you have to realize that. We don't know how to change this. What we are here for is to bring people together and to, and to set goals and then to allow the community and our district staff and our superintendent to come up with how we are going to get there. And instead of just, you know, we were, you know we're not a part of the means no, we don't, we don't decide all of those things. What we do is we watch what happens. We see what's happening, and we see if it's moving the needle. And so we are very much looking at what's going on to move that needle. Um, thank you. Excellent. And remember to some of the elements that I've shared with, I know there's, I've said a lot. Mm -hmm. That board, because they had that fabulous superintendent, they were on the extreme of disengaged. That's why they listened to the new person that came in and didn't question them on these new reforms because they always just did whatever the previous guy said and it worked. They had an award-winning district and an award-winning superintendent. So they were, just, they were a disengaged board that were just following along with what they normally do and they got caught because you're not always going to have the greatest <laughs> nationally the number one superintendent of the year every time and so they weren't paying attention they weren't listening to their community yeah. at all and disengaged boards often the pendulum swings to the over engaged and it's yep and we do this a lot in life and it's so critical to stop and say no we need to be in the middle we don't want to be over engaged or disengaged if we're overly disengaged we don't want to swing to overly micromanaging so it's really critical that we stay in that middle no matter how extreme things get yep yep all right what else there's lots going on here so that what else that was going on Rosa and Vince I know you guys are talking about some stuff do you have something you want to share well we were this is on um, we were just talking about um, how like kind of what you were just saying to me is um, there was like a pendulum swing, right? Like you went from a very stable kind of situation and then you went too far to like the trendy new fast, like flashy stuff. And then, you know, then you have another swing back when that goes wrong, right? And you get board members, you know, kicked off the board and, and then it all starts to kind of crumble like you spoke about earlier, right? Like it causes destabilization, people leave, you have a bunch of, uh, turnover in superintendents, probably in staff as well. So it kind of um, causes like just this feeling of like the world is falling apart. So I need to get out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. Did you did you want to share that too? Excellent. Excellent. I was just going to mention that it seemed like there was lack of continuity in several years. Um, because of trauma, you know, one change after another, and then it seems like after that is there's a lot of dissatisfaction um, between the community and and the schools. So it it looks like there was a lot of conflict that just started um, about 2007 yeah. going forward. That's right, and I can tell you at this time. So I am two doors down from the then superintendent in the district building, teaching an evening class for North Carolina State University uh, to a group of principals from that district. And they all saw those inconsistencies. They all heard 
the dissatisfaction from community. The superintendent never heard it. None of the board members heard it. But everybody else in the system was hearing it. What happened? Why did the board not hear it? One of the things that we see is, to Vincent's point, is that when you and Rosa, really, both of you're talking about when there's a change in the community, if we're playing a particular role where we don't look out and monitor what's happening in the community and we don't see new voices, new groups in the community, we can miss those individuals' voices. And sometimes that we, we get nailed for it, right? Is that dissatisfaction builds and builds and builds in the community. Those folks don't, they know they're not being heard. They feel that and then it becomes explosive. Do you see that? So the, the model is a model of balance. It's a model of balance between, because now remember now, I'm gonna bring you full circle. The trustee role would be you, you're building team. You don't want to bring a whole lot of polarizing things from the outside because that is hard on the team. Delegate is I'm bringing voices in from outside. Remember what I said, balance, balance, balance. The boards that are the most effective, they neither play the trusty role nor the delegate role. They play both roles and they know when to play which role. In this particular community, there was a huge change in the community. The board needed to look out to that group of individuals and listen to them. And then they needed to come back in as a team and effectively address those concerns that they were hearing. So it's, it's not about just, I'm bringing in voices, I'm bringing in voices, I'm bringing in voices. You're bringing in voices, but then you've got to work as a team to resolve those concerns and challenges together. And if you are the only one on the board that is caring about those issues or working on those issues because you've alienated all the rest of your board members because you've been a one-topic board member constantly, now when you come back as a team, you, you tend not, we see those boards not get anything done because they don't like each other. They don't like that person. <laughs> they don't like that board member. That board member has never been reasonable. They never worked as a team. And so now when the problem does need to be a team solution, they can't get it done. Go ahead, John. I was gonna say, uh, maybe another way of thinking, at least I'm thinking about yeah. this way, is that um, the feedback from the community is like data. It's like doing your research. You're going to the archives. I'm a historian by training. So you go into the archives, you do your primary source research, you bring it in, bring it home, you make sense of it. You do analysis, you interpret it, you make an argument. And the board takes that data from the community and it analyzes, interprets it, makes sense of it, and then channels it into policy or actions or a argument, maybe, yeah. that could then be used effectively. And it also then, provides an explanation for that community settlement. And what John said is is really, because I was about to make a comment at the same time, but it ties perfectly into what John said, because taking that data from the community, I feel like it's so important that we have committees. You know, when, when we first did boundaries, the staff, I think, made recommendations and the board made decisions, and that was a terrible way. Boundaries are hugely hugely polarizing and that's going to be a tough time that's going to be when you're going to see people come in and they're going to complain but we gather a committee the committee helps to make these boundaries we don't just gather a committee from this area or this area we gather a committee from everybody so that so that we're not ignoring any of those new voices we're not ignoring any of the old voices we're getting everybody's input then the community makes the decision and then we make a final decision so i think committees are critical to help us with that trustee role and get the data like John is saying, and then, and then that delegate, um, as we work together to make the best decision from that among ourselves. We did the same thing with, with the redistricting as well of the, and it was, and I feel like that was hugely successful um, as, as we went about that process and were able to bring the community together rather than polarizing in them in something that could have been very polarizing. Excellent, excellent.
So you see, again, even here, it's about the, the balance between the two roles that you play, um, looking inward and looking outward. And when there's change in the community is when you want to look outward. One analogy or one visual that I like to use is this. I happen to be fortunate we have our home in Prosser, but we also have a home in the middle of the woods on the west side, okay? I've got six acres of old growth timber that my wife and I manage, and we have lots of deer. So this is a picture from my house. And this is sort of like that. Uh, effective board members act like this deer acts when it's taking a drink of water. And if you've ever seen a deer take a drink of water, I'll tell you what they don't do. They don't go up to the stream stick their head in the water and just sit there for a long time and drink and drink and drink and drink. Do you guys know how, have you seen a deer drink? How do they drink? Anybody? That's right. They, that's right. Cautiously. <laughs> that's right. And they go, they go, this. they go, drink, look, <laughs> drink, look, <laughs> right? That's how they drink because <laughs> they don't want to be surprised. This board got surprised because they just had their heads stuck down in the water. They weren't looking around. Their community had totally changed, and they, had, they didn't even notice. The voices were changed. The demands of the community changed. They didn't even notice. So doing the role when it needs to be done is what we see being a most effective. So... How should boards gather targeted input from specific communities or groups? Um, you guys have talked about this. Amy, you just mentioned it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go past this question for you guys because you talked about it and you even have a policy that you developed that, that this, the previous board adopted on identifying community members, identifying changes in the community, using the superintendent and board members to, to bring in, here, here are some new folks in our community, we need to hear them, and then calendarizing who, which of you is going to go out and touch, have touch points with those organizations or groups, instead of it just being sort of random, right? being systematic about it and then what do you do when you go meet with those groups do you, do you have you want to hear their story but then do you have a story to carry to them i had one board member in in tennessee who shared a story he said i i'd i'd always gone to this group um it's because i i went to that group before i was a board member Never thought to ask to tell them, here's a need. One time, accidentally, he said, man, the utility bills are killing us. You know how, how much water and sewage costs in a school district with all those buildings? It's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's crazy. And the, the organization said, didn't you know? You can get, we have this deals, you know, uh, public schools can get a 20% reduction on utilities, blah, 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 blah. Save the district a lot of money, accidentally. So it's good to hear the community voice, but it's also good to have a message that you take out to the community and say, here's some things that we're doing. Here's some needs that we have. You'll get response from the community to help you, and they'll be happy because they want to be a part of making their schools better. And Tom, I think that's something you could help us with. We haven't really got a really organized ready to make sure that we're getting out to all the clubs and stuff. It's something that there's a lot of things you can do as a board, and that's one place that I think our board could really improve. Yeah. I, I brought, thank you, Amy. I brought that up because as you go down this road, and we are not, we're not going to be able to go there tonight, but frequently if boards say, and you, you need to as a board. One of the things that I said to Amanda and Michelle and Amy when we met was that as a primarily new board here, it's important that you understand the differences between governance models and that you, you have to decide, yeah, that's the direction we want to go. We want to go with that. 
if you do go with, with this model, there are ways to implement the model. In other words, and this is an example. There's policies and protocols and procedures that you can put in place that help you avoid this kind of a bad situation that assist you. It doesn't solve every problem. Policies don't solve every problem, okay? But it can help, all right? And so we, we've worked with boards who are saying, yeah, we want to avoid this. How can we do it? And what you just brought up, Amy, is a great example of that. It's just a simple procedure. It's a simple policy. Effective boards communicate outside the community um, note to support, find support for the district, not for themselves. This is a big thing that unfortunately we, we don't frequently see. We usually see the board is out in the community for themselves. They're out to get reelected. They're whatever. They're not really there representing the needs of the district. And that's not their fault. I'm not blaming the board. They just, they've never seen that as their role. Number three, we better get moving here. Advocacy focus. This one's a difficult one to understand. We're not going to be able to unpack it uh, very much tonight. But there is an, it's interesting the difference. And by the way, I should have mentioned this to you. If you will look in your packet, starting on page seven, and we're actually on, uh, this one's on page eight. If you want to turn to page eight, I provided each of these 10 items with a description, sort of a, my best attempt at describing the difference between, like in this case, being posi uh, position driven and interest driven. And so you can take a look at that. If there's any of these that you're saying, I still don't really understand what he was, what he was getting at. This is a tough one because a lot of people say, well, it's, there's nothing wrong with me having an, having a, taking a position on something. I agree with that. But hear me out. Positionality, the way I'm using it in this, is drawing a line in the sand and saying, I'm this and you're that. That's a position. Being, having an interest is what common interest do we have? And how can we come together to solve a common problem or succeed in a common interest? Finding that common interest is how we see effective boards work. They do not positionalize. With the, they, and they don't let the community positionalize them. They don't bring in issues that are polarizing into their board. And when people try to have them do that, which they will, they'll want to use the board as a tool to further their particular polarizing position. You as a board member, effective board members, know you're empathetic, you listen, that's exactly right. Yep, John, you had it right. You don't tell people, no, I don't care, I'm not gonna do that. You listen, you're empathetic, and then you actually do try to bring their issue in, but you bring it in as an interest. You don't bring it in as the position that they, how they, they introduced it, necessarily. Does that make sense? So that's what boards do. It's tough, really tough to do that and not have the winners and losers but let's let's find that interest we can all agree to student concern focus effective board members have a broad focus rather than targeting only on specific students or specific issues there are a lot of issues there are a lot of different students you cannot hope as a board member to, if each of you, if each of the five of you represented one particular group in your district, as much as they legitimately need help, they need somebody to be their voice, absolutely true, you will only cover five groups. <laughs> the math doesn't work. There's a lot more groups than that. There's a lot more folks with need. There's a lot more students with need. There's a lot more issues affecting students today. And that's the problem with that. So you've got to be a board member that represents multiple interests. It's not that you don't strongly support interest. 
It's that you can't be one interest. It's got to be multiple needs, multiple interests, or we're going to have a whole bunch of folks who are not going to be heard, and they're not going to be happy about that. They're not going to support the district. Number five, this is the one that, that Sydney, that you brought up. Common, see this? They know that they focus on solutions that are contextualized, not standardized. Okay? And let me say this, super controversial. You can take this or leave it, but I'm going to give you a little trick. We, are, we have, are famous in education for bringing in name brand uh, programs, and then 10, 15 years down the road, they're gone. And a lot of those programs, people will, a group of the community will decide they don't like the program, and instantly the name polarizes folks. I could reel off a whole list of names of programs that's, that's happened to. Here's how you avoid that. Stop using the brand name. Just a friendly tip. In other words, it's not Singapore math. It's Pasco School District math. There you go. Problem solved. You don't need to sell Singapore math. Singapore math was hugely popular. Now it's going out of style. In a few more years, people will say it's terrible. We shouldn't do Singapore math. If you hadn't called it Singapore math, <laughs> you just called it, here's a great math program that we do in Pasco, and we call it the Pasco math model, it would still be in fashion. Never goes out of fashion. And more importantly, it doesn't polarize people with the name because people like to take that name and then they love it or hate it based on the name. They can love the program. I literally had parents do that. I, I did this in, in a gr group once when I was the principal. I showed them this program. And they, oh, we love this program. Greatest program ever. Will you support this program? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and then they turned afterwards. I picked it up and they started talking about how they hated this new program that was coming into the schools. That was the program. <laughs> They just looked at. I just didn't tell them what it was called. <laughs> okay. So, you know, that's the reality of how, how things can happen. So don't make problems you don't need. You got enough problems to, to deal with just as it is. Number six, exercise of influence. Effective board members know that as individuals, they do not have any power. Legally, you don't have any power. You only work collectively. It's a team sport, as I said before. Number seven, before uh, we Tom, get there. Uh, yeah, what go was ahead. The, uh, you have appropriate visibility on there. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, now I got to uh, back this guy up. Okay, so, so let me back this guy up. Uh, appropriate visibility. Yes. Uh, Peterson. Peterson did a study, fascinating study. Um, he followed board members who came into schools to do school visitations and found in some cases that student performance actually declined as a result of those visits. And here's why. Because when that board member came in, they know who you are. They know you're the big cheese. You can't do anything about it. You can't say, oh, I'm just, I'm just Rosa. You don't need to be scared of me. No, you're not. You're a board member. I'm afraid of you. You're going to come in and critique my school right now. So I'm going to circle the wagons. I'm going to go into protection mode. I'm not going to try anything creative or innovative in front of you that might fail. You see what I mean? So when there was frequent board visits, you, we actually saw performance decline. Appropriate visibility, what's the difference? And by the way, that was unannounced drop-in visits where board members, they didn't know they were doing this, but they innocently said, hey, have you thought about Singapore Math? I'm picking on Singapore Math tonight. <laughs> it's a great program, that's why I'm picking on it. Have you thought about that? Well, to, in their ears, they just heard, you better have Singapore Math in this school next time I come here. That's a directive. Appropriate visibility, Board member comes to the play. Board member comes to the football game, the, the volleyball game. Board member comes to the concert. Board member comes, see the difference? 
You sit in the audience. You congratulate the folks, the kids. That's appropriate visibility. In the meantime, are people going to talk to you? Yeah. Are you going to find some stuff out? Yeah. That's it. In those scenarios, then folks got comfortable with you. And by the way, having Emily, Sydney, and Logan here is another big step. You know, a lot of boards, in fact, the vast majority of boards do not have any student reps anymore. That used to be really popular. It's now gone out of popularity. They don't have student reps anymore. Why? I was just going to ask you, do you know why? <laughs> we like our students. The school board members don't like being challenged. Okay. Mm -hmm. What else? We're just getting real here. Maybe they only did it because it was a trend that was popular at the time. It's a trend that was popular at the time. Do you think a board that wants to call each other names, be dysfunctional, polarize themselves, argue about whatever the latest crisis is? Wants students sitting there watching them behave like that? You know, that's when most of the student reps were canceled, removed from the board, was during this COVID season. Mm -hmm. And with community yeah. members that showed up and protesting and yelling and screaming. Uh, yeah. They want students there for that. Students make you behave make you talk civilly to each other. <laughs> because act like adults. Huh? Activist board members don't like students being around. My, I'm using activists in a specific way. Yeah. You should be an activist, of course. Appropriate activist. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. That's why. A sign of healthier boards, they have student reps. Interesting, huh? They want their students to see how they do business, to emulate, to model for them, because they're a functional group. They, they're showing the students how you do it. That's same with appropriate visibility. Next big question. We've got about 15 minutes to go, but we're going to take about five minutes on this, and then we'll wrap up. Um, what do you think? This is a tough one. I might get in trouble for asking this, Michelle. <laughs> but let's see what you do with this one. No, I'm not going to get in trouble. OK, good. Okay, good. Um, I want to see what you think, what you have to say. Think about the balance thing again. So, where should you be? Where should you be? Rosa and Vince, you guys want to start us off? That's my question. No, I think it's like a Well, that informed, right? Like informed questioning, right? So, we shouldn't be in charge of 
developing the curriculum per uh -huh. se right. or dictating what that curriculum looks like. Right. It's more about like a review kind of standpoint, right? Like, hey, let, let's look at what the curriculum and the what you're doing, right? And then ask questions and yep. think about it and ask the questions from the standpoint of like what's best for our community, for our kids. Yeah, did you see that? Great, great. Did you see the balance? So Rosa said, don't, don't be overreaching, micromanage, right? But here's what, what unfortunately a lot of boards say, I just stay out of it. Now you're disengaged. So it's, you have a role, even in this. But what is that role if you're going to do it in an effective way? And you said it, Rosa. You kind of you kind of snuck it in there. What does the community want in the area of curriculum instruction? That's you can direct that. You don't write the curriculum. You're not sitting on the committee that's wordsmithing it. Let the experts. I heard Vincent. You say that, but you have the role. To say, you know what? Our community is really interested in. And the school board adopts the broad strategic goals of the district. And so the directive from the board to the superintendent would be the curriculum should be designed to advance our district strategic goals. Yeah, and you should, set, you should help set the strategic goals, the direction. So let me give you one. Our community is interested in students going to college but they're also interested in having students go into the trades it's not all everybody goes to college they want both that's a that's a type of direction i'm talking about that the board could bring and give direction now you 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 guys go make that happen we want we want strong voc ed we want strong academics, both. Go, do it. <laughs> and we're gonna be overseeing it and we're gonna be holding you accountable to make that happen. There's your, ins your informed oversight. And you gave the direction though. You didn't just let this have, oh, we're doing all academics, everybody has to go to college, we're gonna cancel out. Now if you think, what are you talking about? If you've been around education for very long, that happened. Do you guys remember when that happened? It was when the Wassel test was here and most schools were canceling vocational ed programs because it was all about academics. The community had no voice in that. There was no balance. Now we're seeing that was a mistake and we're starting to come back to balance. But that's the role the board can play. Make sense? Yeah. So you have a role. Most boards I, that I work with, they're never asked that broad question. What does the community want in terms of academics folk? I'm just using that as one example. They're never asked. In my opinion, this staff should come and say, ask that broad question, where does the community want to see broadly in our curriculum instruction? And then the staff should go create it. They shouldn't come and say, oh, we've already created everything and we're just gonna tell you what we did. See the difference? There's actually protocols and policies on that too. You can actually have a policy that says, first, you'll come and ask us our broad input from the community, then the, then the staff will go produce, and then they'll bring it back in a report, bum, 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 bum. It's not complicated, it doesn't have to be super detailed, but there it is. And we're running out of time. Effective boards set the strategic goals, just like you said, John, that d more, most directly impact student learning. They focus on checking those strategic goals to make sure progress is being made. The last thing, you guys are gonna be getting some training coming up. Um, I understand, which is great, from WASDA, there's somebody who's really good at, at relationship, inner, inner board relationships. If remember I said the teamwork aspect is really important. That's an important aspect. Uh, Meredith Montford and um, Chris Bruner did a lot of work in what things create the biggest conflict between board members that breaks trust and makes them no longer able to work together as a team. This is one of them, the use of voice. 
And it's, I know it's kind of, doesn't sound s super sophisticated, but um, this makes sense to a lot of people that I talk to. Are you as a board member trying to tell and sell or are you trying to hear and understand? Most effective boards, the members hear and understand. They're not about making sure my point is being heard. Making, and, and, and what you hear, if you watch, and I watch a lot of boards and analyze them, what you'll see is the board member will make the point and then nobody's like jumping on board. So then they make it again and they make it again and they make it again <laughs> and, they, and they're just all night long hammer, hammer, hammer. It's a power play. They're not listening to anybody else. They're not hearing the rest of their board members. This is the, what I'm talking about with that breaking relationship. Pretty soon the rest of the board, they don't listen to that person anymore. They're never gonna go along with anything they say. That person's interest is never gonna be met. They're just gonna polarize the board. It's because the way they're using their voice. They don't hear others and show that they understand and respect other people's ideas along with their idea. There has to be that balance. Use of power goes really closely along with use of voice. People that over, over voice or do not listen to others and try to understand them or find some interest together exercise power over people rather than power with people. Power with people, and this is, this is really interesting to me because a lot of power over people use language that makes them sound like power with people. And here's what I mean. They'll say, um, they'll, they'll bully people into listening to others. <laughs> they'll silence others so they listen to them. Wait a minute. And then say, I'm all about hearing all the voices. No, no, they're not. They're about hearing their voice and silencing everybody else. That's what they're about. But they keep telling us how they want every voice to be heard. If they wanted every verse to be heard, they would listen to every voice. Not just a one or two. They would hear every voice. So true advocates, that's pow empowering other individuals. Even though I totally disagree with everything you're about to say, I'm going to empower you to say it. And I'm going to listen respectfully and I'm going to try to understand your point of view. And that's going to gain us a relationship so that we can work together and make things happen. Maybe we'll find a third way to do things. We used a definition in our study. We're going to wrap up with this. Um, in terms of power. I want you to look at, this was an actual question on the survey. We asked the board members to pick, and I know it's hard, but pick the description of power that, that you think resonates with you. This is how you view power, as you think about power. So pick the one that you connect with the most. Okay, ready? You got your pick? Emily's not quite ready. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I saw you shake your head. No. Yeah, okay, we're good. Yes? All right. If you're in the red, you don't have to tell anybody, you're a power over person. <laughs> That's how you view power. It doesn't mean you use power that way, but that's how you've always ta been taught. That's your understanding of power. That's how you think things should be. So you're power over, okay. When we went out, uh, we asked people to tell us about power. So these were actual quotes from members from the study. So the, here's a board member that used power over power. They described, this board member, power is authority or control of others. That's how they define power. Authority or control of others. We then ask their colleagues, how does that person, what's that person like? The person that said power is authority and control. You see what their colleagues said about them. By the way, this is perception. 
I've just did this analysis, by the way, with a board. That was part of that report I mentioned. Ask the board member, where do you think you are in these characteristics? And then I ask each of the other board members, where do you think that person is in these characteristics? All anonymous. The person has a misperception. They think they are conveying one thing, and yet what everybody else on the board is seeing is completely different from what they think they're conveying. And it's tragic because that person doesn't even realize it. And when are you going to be able to talk about that as a board? Because of open public meeting laws and all that, very difficult to have that kind of conversation. Oh, I didn't, once they found out, oh, I didn't know I came across that way. I don't, I don't mean to do that. I need to, I need to change how I'm saying things, I guess. That's not what I meant. Here's what the superintendent said about that person. Power with the opposite. Here's the definition that we saw. It's a different definition of power, isn't it? Here's what their colleagues said about them. Here's what the superintendent said about them. Sometimes we learn the language you were supposed to use, but we're hiding our real feelings. So I call it mixed power. What do you think of these two statements? You see what I mean? This person knows what they're supposed to say, right? Power is working with others to get them to do what I want them to do. <laughs> I just went from power with to power over, right? So sometimes we learn the language, but we're still exercising power over, even though we're saying the right words. Guess what? Nobody's fooled by it. <laughs> they know you're exercising power over them, and they don't like it. They're not going to work with you if you do that. Number nine, we make decisions collaboratively. We've talked about that, and we, use, uh, we monitor progress. We ask clarifying questions. I heard um, you guys talk about that. Um, Vincent and Rosa were talking, you guys were talking about this, asking clarifying questions, this kind of a thing. And the final one is, why are you serving on the board? Is it for altruistic reasons? Is it, for, is it to help the school, help the kids, or is it personal motivation? We ask this question. We're going to close with this. We ask board members, why are you on the board? Here's what they said. This is an amazing statistical fact that in a survey of over 5,000 school board members nationally, zero of them said that they were on the board for ego or personal prestige. A statistical miracle. <laughs> <laughs> so we said, uh, well, we better ask your colleagues why you're on the board. So we did that next. And here's what their <laughs> colleagues said. Hmm. Almost a third now for kind of not very good reasons. And then we were really mean and we asked the superintendent why those board members were on the board. And it got worse. And the scary thing is when you look at these final numbers, look at that but with the colleagues or the superintendent. 38.5% or 30% were all that we get for people on the board to help all students and a desire to serve.
effective boards, we don't see this. this these were national statistics. We, we, we do not see this. We see high percentages in those second and third categories. People are on for the right reasons. That's really what I had for you uh, tonight, and I'm out of time. There's a couple of ways that you can do profiles on these characteristics that I just shared with you. There's an example of, uh, uh, of a board. Do they hear and understand or tell and sell? I wanted to show you this so you can see you can have these conversations anonymously. Also, the PASCO board has used this, this kind of a tool to evaluate the board in the past. And so bringing these kind of conversations in a way that's not dangerous because it's not personal, you can't identify anybody, is really helpful. So you can actually talk about some of these things. And then there's individual coaching that can privately be done. Here's a board member that's out of touch with how they're coming across, according to the rest of their colleagues. And... That's all I got for you. Thank you for putting up with a lot of talking on my heart tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We are a little bit short. We have a little bit of time. Oh, did you want to clap? Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Osbury. I feel like that was, that was um, great. I think that really helped us to understand what really makes a, an effective board. So really appreciate it. That um, self-evaluation that we do for each other that really helps us see how other board members um, see each other is really effective. But we are such a new board, we thought about putting that off for about a year until we've worked together long enough to get to know one another and, um, and then perhaps going into that. So because it really is a good tool. It's a little scary to some board members, but we've done it and I think all of us were pleasantly surprised at, at um, at how effective that was, and it and it wasn't as hard as we thought it was going to be. So, so thank you. Um, so we are going to go into executive session right now, and then we will start our um, formal for our formal board meeting at 6:30. Um, and the executive session. Do I need to read that? 42:1. Yeah, we will go into executive session for the reason of 42:30. 110 1G, I, that will be 